With so many archetypes showing, the scope of strategies growing, will any of them break the chain? Or was I right last week about Esper and Domain? It only matters if it ladders. Comment below as we walk through the week seven recap of Karloff Manor Standard. All right, we worked out the bugs, everybody. Tier one kicks off with the usual archetypes featuring Demir Aggro, Esper Midrange, Boros Convoke, and Domain. However, Tema Ramp makes the jump to join them this week in an exciting development that we can't wait to talk about. Oh yeah, and tier two highlights Golgari Midrange's current slump with Mono Red and Azorius Control holding steady. Joining them is Gruul Aggro, creeping back into top eights around the world once more. And last but not least, we have a spicy Brewer's Corner for you, including Four Color Reclamation out of Japan, an Artifact Burn List, a Devilish Combo Deck, and some good old-fashioned Mono Green Stompy out of our Rebellion Discord. Get ready, folks, because these brews have been cooking. Oh, yeah. Rebels, as you know, we've partnered with TOA Magic on our State of the Meta series. For those of you who aren't already using TOA Magic for your paper tournament needs, click the link below in our description to head on over after the video and check out their store. While you're there, don't forget to use code REBELLION for 5% off at checkout. As always, TOA Magic can deliver all your cards in one package with free track shipping on every order and over 1 million fulfilled orders to date. We're all about dependability here at the Rebellion and TOA gets it done right. Oh yeah, now on to our Tier 1 Archetype Breakdown, starting with Demir Aggro. Another week has come and gone with Demir ascending to the top of the ranks once more, featuring three trophies across 15 different pilots achieving top 8 results with this archetype. Featured here is Love Jeance's list that made it to the top 4 of the 116 player pizza box open this past Sunday. Now, folks, this list was chosen over the various trophy winners because it represents a major divergence in the evolution of this archetype. Now that we're seeing the power right here with Prof's eidetic memory, it's, it's an amazing engine. We're noting it doesn't have to stick to a strict mono blue shell, which is where this was initially tested and tried. But this build in particular intrigues as it blends the efficient removal of black with a card draw available in blue to present a tempo list that runs low on the curve and high on power. Now, it'll be another week or two before we see if this build pans out or if it was a one and done before the format adapts to it. All I know is that we it just makes me want to try four Fairy Mastermind in basically every Demir and Esper deck because this deck is drawing so many cards just to fuel that Prof's eidetic memory. Impressive looking list. Uh, no, a noted four of Steam Core Scholar. On the surface, this doesn't look like a very impressive card, especially when you have Gix competing in that same slot. So why would this pilot go four copies of that over a couple more copies of Gix? Well, Max, when I look at Steam Court Scholar, what I'd note are two very important things. First, it has evasion. It's got flying and it's got vigilance, which means Wandering Emperor not dealing with that card. And it will ranch Wandering Emperor when it hits play. The second part is that it's drawing cards on impact and it's usually giving you that uh, two for one advantage where you're drawing two, discarding one. So you're immediately just getting on a two for one value train. And th the list still runs a Gix for that exact reason that you can get Steam Core into Gix and really push forward and draw a ton of cards. And that's what you're trying to do with a Proth stack. You're trying to draw as many cards as you can so that you can bolster these creatures. And I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen a Deep Cavern Bat that hits 6-6 six, six because of Prophets, but it's kind of wild. And Steam Core allows you to get into that engine with Prophets really efficiently. Yeah, notably has an effect right as it hits the battlefield as well, which is very important. Uh, all right, very good. Talk to us now about Esper Midrange. All right, Casa smashed through a 59-player MTGO challenge this past Saturday, taking down the trophy and cementing Esper Midrange in the Tier 1 world once more. As an archetype, Esper Midrange took six different pilots to the top eights this past weekend, snagging three trophies along the way. Now, this build continues to be your standard iteration of efficient creatures, removal, counters, and scaling power level for each threat they don't answer. The mana base has gone light on the fast lands, opting instead for this playset of restless anchorages as a means of shoving four more threats into the deck to help those grindy mid-range mirrors and control matchups. The sideboard also now has those two unlicensed hurts, yep, right there, signaling an acknowledgement of Temer Ramp in the format and the absolute necessity of interacting with graveyards right now. I mean, I look at a deck like this, Max, and it is just so balanced. I think that's why Esper has stuck around as the format has continued to adapt and evolve. It's just high power level per card, your parity's higher than, on average, anybody whatever anybody else in the format's doing. And it does it so efficiently. It really does. It really does. Uh, so, 
this deck, just like a couple of others that we're going to talk about today, have established the importance of Graveyard Hate because of Temer. What else do you want from this sideboard against that list? I mean, what I like here is that they're doing that 2-2 split on Unlicensed Hearse and Disdainful Stroke because having counters against the Temer ramp lists, it's important. Mm. They're playing a lot of mm. game-ending spells that cost more than four mana. Disdainful Stroke is really well positioned there. Negate's also pretty well positioned there, frankly. That said, they have loops that allow them to get the cards back after you counter them, and they have ways to disrupt your counters with those malevolent hermits you're going to see in the sideboard here in a few minutes. So I like that we're splitting into Graveyard Hate. If I'm going to hedge a little bit harder, I'm probably going into Kutzel's Flankers just so I get a little more interaction mm -hmm. with the graveyards. Makes a lot of sense. I like Kutzel's Flanker. All right, talk to us about the next deck, Boros Convoke. Special Boy made it to the semifinals of a Sunday 95-player MTGO challenge with Boros Convoke, making them one of 12 pilots to hit top eights with this deck over the weekend, though a notable lack of trophies abounds this time. Now, the build we see here is fairly standard, though we once more are moving away from War Leader's Call, and the preference is Sanguine Evangelist. Similarly, there's no Bunnicorns to be found in this build, but the two Yodian Frontliners have become a staple of this archetype as we move forward. Over in the sideboard, we see that there are three copies of Thalia for control decks, and a couple of those Kutso flankers we were just talking about sitting down there as well. Just as a reminder, Temer Ramp exists, and those graveyards got to be interacted with moving forward. Now, odds are the Thalias are coming in as a straight swap for Case of the Getaway Express, uh, with two copies of Invasion of Gobicon to supplement them when this version faces off against control. And I, I like that plan quite a bit. It, it's adapting a little bit more to the uh, Urbrask Forge hate we're seeing out of Azori's control lately. Yeah, you know my feelings about this deck. Uh, I'm, I'm a little sad to see the exclusion of War Leader's Call, but in any event, uh, is Case of the Gateway Express getting enough done in, the, in its matchups uh, in this archetype to warrant four copies? I think so. I mean, honestly, it's going to be great when you can hit all three modes in the same turn essentially you know where you're able to play it kill something swing three creatures hit the boost the next turn in that case it's acting kind of like a sanguine evangelist that gives you removal the problem is you're not going to play it on turn two typically and have much of an effect because you're only going to be able to drop one creature on turn one right so the odds of you getting to kill anything on turn two very low it's a turn three play and possibly mm -hmm. that's what it's there for though is that double spell on turn three where you're going like gleeful demolition case let's go um, I think it's fine if we're going to be matched up against Amir, if we're going to be matched up against Esper Midrange, I like Case. If we're going up against Domain, Control, Temer Ramp, I hate playing that card in the main. It's so dead most <laughs> of the time. So it, it just depends where you yeah. think the meta is, right? Agreed, agreed. Now, talking about Domain, let's, let's talk about Domain. Bo Bandy 08 came in hot to the finals of the 61-player MTG Challenge this past Saturday with their take on Domain pushing an almost mono-white sideboard plan as the next step for this archetype. Nine other pilots managed to top eight this past weekend as well with Domain, cementing it in tier one land for another week. Now, once more, Max, we're, we're seeing Spelunking over here, getting the nod over temporary lockdown to populate spot removal, any of the other stuff we've seen in the main board over the last three months. And yet again, Imidate's Recruiter is getting posted up here instead of Nyssa Ascended Animist. So we're, we're seeing it really cement into these exact choices instead of, you know, splitting into temporary lockdowns or any of the other cards we talked about. Now, the sideboard highlights that Kutzel's Flanker has become a mainstay in basically every archetype that has the color white available to it. And otherwise, what you see here is pretty basic. You got Elish Norns for the mirror, Negates for the mirror and Control. Uh, you've got Lockdown for all those hyper aggro decks like Boros Convoke and a couple copies of Get Lost and Wandering Emperor to round things out for the mid-range grind fests. Oh yeah, I've I've seen in that shutdown uh, mode the the Thrill Keeper uh, as well, uh, but Elish Norn has returned to multiple sideboards, not just domain and standard. What archetypes does Elish Norn typically come in against? I mean, Elish Norn is fantastic if you're ramping to it against Boros Convoke, specifically if you get to go with like a temporary lockdown or any other kind of sweeper followed by Elish Norn because it's going to shut down Convoke's triggers and that's going to lock it out of the game really fast. And it's still a huge clock very hard to remove very very difficult to deal with very difficult to interact with so it's there for the mirror it's there for boris convoke i don't know that i love it against much of anything else in the format right now 
But that's not to say, uh, especially with Domain, that it doesn't come in. Because if you're grinding, Elish Norn is giving you double triggers on Ley Lines, Invasions, Topiary Stompers, Atraxas, the list goes on. So I could see it coming in against like Golgari Midrange, where we're just trying to grind them out. And we want that uh, double trigger, but not necessarily... It's kind of like an extra up the beanstalk, so to speak. You, you get where I'm going with it? Yeah, yeah. Imagine Mono Red trying to deal with uh, Elish Norn. Like, that's that's really hard. <laughs> yeah, that, that Witch Doctor frenzy ain't going to get it done there. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but let's talk about the final deck in our Tier 1 archetypes, Temur Ramp. All right, Temur Ramp joins the Tier 1 ranks at long last, with, with last weekend placing eight different pilots in various top eights. However, one player went further. Sinistar619 took down a 95-player MTGO challenge this past Sunday with Temur Ramp, highlighting the next evolutionary step for the archetype. Now, in the main here, you're going to see that we now have Doppelgang, which gives the deck an additional method to deal with all those pesky stone brains that have been running around. And the first copy of Vampire's Vengeance is also sitting here, acting as that fifth sweeper for low-end tempo lists, with another two copies in the sideboard to ensure we get those sweepers timely. Now, I particularly like the mirror tech of Turn the Earth, which I don't know if you guys have spent any time looking at this, but if they're going to deck you with Jace, just use Turn the Earth and shuffle three cards back into your library. And one of those three cards is probably going to be a Rhydo Sentinel, which lets you perpetually escape the Jace issue. So I, I like that we have that two to one split here for exactly that. I also really love that there's Malevolent Hermit in the sideboard because being able to get an early interaction to stutter your way through control and then after they kill it, comes back and ensures, as long as you retain priority, that you can cast your next spell uncounterably. That seems pretty good when you have giant fireball effects. This deck, it's a lot more consistent than I initially thought it would be. You don't typically see that from a deck fashion this way. It has the single win con. We talked last week about that. Uh, is Doppelgang going to be enough to deal with Stonebrain, or does the deck actually need an additional win con? I think it's probably enough. Um, the way Stonebrain's positioned, we're only seeing typically a couple copies in sideboards at most. Mm -hmm. And until I start seeing like three to four Stonebrains in the main, I'm not very concerned with the fact that we don't have a ton of different ways to interact and win the game, because at the end of the day, all they need to present is one threat and we doppelgang it a million times, right? And that's fine. Mm -hmm. Like even a 1-1 one, one doppelgang 20 times is gonna be plenty. It'll get it done. So I, I like where it's positioned right now. If we start seeing uh, like Golgari going to four stone brains and four devious cover-ups and, you know, a bunch of interaction with bats and duresses and graveyard interaction, uh, all right, we, we need diversification. But at the point where they've overloaded their board that way, they're losing to other archetypes. So I think the beauty of this diverse meta is that you can't just overload into stone brains without sacrificing points in basically every other matchup. And Temur Ramp isn't dominant enough yet to force that. That's a really good point. Yeah, you, you sacrifice something for Stone Brain every time. All right, well, that does it for our Tier 1 archetypes. Let's go ahead and go on to Tier 2, where I'll kick things off with Golgari Midrange. I love this name. Apple Chips came out swinging with the latest update on Golgari Midrange, taking down a 116-player pizza box open to keep this deck on the tier ladder. Oddly enough, after a dominant week six, week seven for this archetype was lackluster, including only two top eight performances. Innovations from this list include Analyze the Pollen as a two of, a card that has useful modes for both the early game and the late game. We also see Liliana returning here as a two of in the main, and the rest of the list for the most part looks very similar to what we've seen in past weeks. But what I do want to highlight here is the one of Sentinel of Lost Lore in the sideboard comes in notably against especially against a deck like Temur Ramp if you want the the exile mode comes in a turn quicker than frill back and I wonder if this you know small addition here is an indication that this deck that this card might go up and count in subsequent weeks with the success of Temur Ramp um could it be a potential solution to that deck Fair, fair. And I mean, when, you, when you've when you already loaded up on Frillbacks, and I mean, this deck hasn't played four, but you are loading up on four drops with Tranquil Frillback, and sometimes you just need to blow out the grave on three. So I get Sentinel coming in. Yeah. The question mark for me with this deck is, you know, is Analyze the Pollen correct? Is Tough Cookie correct? Do we really want to go like Tempo with Bats and Gicks and Cookies? Like, is, is that where we're trying to go with this deck? I feel like, and this might be a hot take, I don't know, but I feel like I don't believe the deck needs to go that route. Um, yes, the domain matchup has historically for this deck been terrible. I don't know that shoring up more tempo to be better in that matchup is a good idea. Golgari traditionally packs a lot of power in its mid game. That's generally what it does. We've seen 
this happened a lot in the past. You create the walls for aggro. Aggro decks are, are still dominant. Um, you throw creatures, you throw glisses at them, arc fiends, and you basically, you know, throw creatures at them until they're dead. Um, I think Golgari is the best at forcing the opponents to basically respond or die. Force Domain to have the board wipe, I say, and just, you know, throw everything out there that you can towards the mid-range game. So I think the deck should really go back to those roots. That's fair. That said, I love the one of Tough Cookie. It's such a weird, random thing to be like, yeah. you know what, those those map tokens, those are 4-4s four this turn. Game on, let's go. So I, as a spicy <laughs> one of, that's got to be the spiciest one of I've seen in Golgari in a minute. But I, I kind of agree with you, too. I don't love trying to turn it into a hyper tempo list. Like, that is what Demir is already doing, and doing it better, in my opinion. You know, like they have counters. agreed. So I, I, I just yeah. don't know about that play, but we'll move it right along. Comment below if you disagree, if you're like, no, 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 Golgari should be tempo. Comment below. Tell us why. We'd love to hear from you. For now, we're going to move on. We're going to talk a little bit about Mono Red Aggro. So while Mono Red didn't score any trophies this week, it did put three pilots in the top eights over the weekend. Uh, featured, featured here is Arcany One's build from the top eight of a 61 player MTGO challenge. The build we're featuring displays how Red has really solidified these past few weeks around the prowess based creature builds with lots of fast, low curve creatures, even faster burn spells that will boost them with prowess. I do like the full set of Frenzy in the main. There are a lot of creature decks, more than not, <laughs> more often than not, you're going to encounter some walls. Uh, you know, think Golgari, think Demir. Uh, you have to be able to kill those creatures. You also have to be able to kill a uh, Aftermath Analyst and Temer Ramp, Rafines and Esper, you know, Glisses. I also like the choice of Furnace Punishers coming back to the sideboard, uh, Urbrass Forge as, as well. These have become sort of staples. Uh, you know, of course, Furnace Punisher against the complex mana bases like Esper, uh, and then, you know, Forge against Control. And the festivities also takes up slots against other aggro decks, thinking Toxic, thinking Boros. So it really feels like Red has a little bit of something to everyone, and what differentiates these builds sometimes is what they bring in the sideboard. So pay, pay as much attention to the sideboard as you do the main board with Red. Now, speaking of uh, a card that was in both the sideboard and the main board, one copy of Twisted Fealty in the main, one in the sideboard. Should we be playing Twisted Fealty in the main board, Max? So for the same reason I said that I like Frenzy in the main, I also do like the one fealty kind of as a, as a last move. Many of the decks we encounter in standard are creature based. Like I said, the mid range heavy decks are going to have that one big creature, you know, attracts on domain. Uh, some even depend on specific creatures for their combos. So as a finisher, this seems like a good card. If your opponent's done the math, you know, and they don't, they see that, you know, they block, they can survive your attack. Suddenly their safe position isn't safe. Fair. Uh, let's move it right along and talk a little bit about Gruel Aggro. So Gruel Aggro similarly didn't score a trophy in week seven, but it does join our tier list nonetheless. Uh, it did place three pilots of its own into the top eights this past weekend. Ro uh, Ross VD's list shown here made it to the semifinals of Saturday's 61 player MTGO challenge. Now, we've seen past iterations of this list that featured, you know, bigger cards like Ons Rog, a couple of other tricks to make that work. This iteration opts instead for a much more low curve and direct battle plan. The deck will catch opponents without targeted removal off guard in a hurry. Rather than burn you and selectively attack with a few boosted creatures, this deck just focuses on the creatures. Ginger Brute, when boosted, can get in for a whole lot of damage unblocked. It's also tougher to remove since classic go for the throat can't hit it. One synergy I want to highlight though is that NT can help the code breaker. Uh, come online with a disguise mode by allowing you to discard the spells you need. So NT helps you discard. Uh, this deck can dig for answers uh, and find the ways to win across NT, Felden, Codebreaker, Seek the Beast on Questing Druid. Uh, it really does dig for answers and it tries to win that way. Fair. Now, the biggest question I have every time I look at Gruel Aggro, I love the list and then I think, can this survive early interaction? Like, does it beat a temporary lockdown or do you just cry and scoop? <laughs> I feel that as a as a Boris Convoke pilot. Um, I think that I, I saw Pick Your Poison, I saw Forge. These seem to be some responses from the sideboard against Temporary Lockdown in particular. Um, against decks with early interaction though, I'm a little bit unsure. It feels like this deck's a bit of a glass cannon against deck like decks like Golgari Midrange, for example. If you don't get the opportunity to actually dig for, you know, the creatures and spells you need, the early target removal can really pick the deck apart before it gets going. 
So we have kind of a, a similar conundrum with this versus temporary lockdown as Golgari perhaps has with Domain and, and Sunfall. We are like, we just have to make them have it. We don't want to spend a ton of sideboard slots shifting what we're doing yep. fundamentally. We just want to force them to have it. I agree. I agree. This deck just tries to push through. Fair, fair. And on that note, speaking of decks that uh, are going to be pushing back against that, Azorius Control. Oh, yeah. I'm sure Athena the Bun is going to have something to say about this being Tier 2, but Azorius Control clung for dear life in the Tier 2 side of the list, placing only two pilots in the top eights this past weekend and claiming no trophies throughout. Featured here is one model's top four list from 12-player MTGO preliminary tournament. This deck really does try to cover all the bases, especially against the creature-based decks that you're seeing a lot in the meta. So the, the two of lockdowns, the one to populate, full set of sunfalls in the main. Uh, and then add to that, of course, one copy of Farewell, seemingly there for its beautiful Exile the Graveyard mode. Uh, it also introduces two Dissipates in addition to the full set of No More Lies in the Counterspell Suite. This deck really does have it all, uh, or it tries to. Uh, and it's really, to me, a wonder that it placed Tier 2 when it was seeing Tier 1 in pri tier one success in prior weeks during Karloff Manor. So, I mean, Max, let, let's talk about that a little bit. Why do you think Azorius Control has fallen off a cliff this last week? So, Occam's Razor, <laughs> I think the most obvious and likely answer is the meta's widened much more than the Control deck can focus on. Typically, Control decks find success later and later that a meta develops as it figures out what its targets are. Um, but the introduction of Temer Ramp, for example, the fact that certain aggro decks haven't really gone away, uh, the shifting of strategies by mid-range decks to be more value adjacent to counter control have all had a cumulative effect on the success of this deck. So there's just, and also I, I want to speculate, there might be less people actually attempting to play this deck as a result as well. So we're not seeing as much success from control. I mean, that's fair. You have tier one decks that can win the game in 10, 15 minutes, like win a match in 10 to 15 minutes. And then you have Azorius Control that might take you an hour to start climbing up the ladder. So I, I can understand where <laughs> less people are intrigued to spend an hour trying to get through one match. That That is... Yeah, not appealing. <laughs> right, right. It just, yeah, it's a fundamental time differential right there for climbing. So I, I get it. That said, we're going to move along. Favorite segment every week, Brewer's Corner. Alrighty, so this is Four Color Reclamation out of Japan. Credit to Kawasaki Hirotaka. Uh, this made it to the semifinals of a large Japanese tournament. And as always, I check the Japanese meta for the Wild Brews because they got the spice every, yes, every time. Do. It's like Dune over there. They just have all the spice. It's fantastic. <laughs> so uh, in this one, you got Can't Stay Away bringing back Slogurks, Titanias, and Nissas. Like, look at the plethora of targets. And yes, you read that right, folks. It's 72 cards in the main because they want to keep fetching all day long. So many basic lands, so many fetch lands. They are just trying to thin and keep rolling. And this deck does a lot of that, eventually ending in a splendid reclamation to grab it all back one more time. But uh, I, I think the point of this really is it's a Slogurk combo. It's a Titania combo. It's trying to go into those two cards and really push through with them. And if I'm remembering this correctly, yeah, that's an elemental, and this gets you elementals mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. second land. So Nissa mm -hmm. just giving you more Nissas, giving you more Titanias. Yep. Ah, yep. That's, some, that's some spice. That's some spice. Well done to yeah. Kawasaki Hirotaka. I, re I remember somebody in our Discord said this deck is awesome because it feels like it's actually intentionally trying to get that Titania morph and not just accidentally do it. <laughs> it's right. designed to do it. Right. So I'm that's pretty cool. But uh, let's let's take things over to Artifact Burn. Credit to SCA of the MTG Rebellion Discord. I just want to highlight a few cards here that work together really well that you might not typically think work well together. War Leaders Call, The Anvil, and Gleaming Gear Drake. These all present an engine base that when utilized give you tons of ways to chump block your way through the bigger decks while you grow your gear drakes and do damage over time. Uh, this deck also has Sunfall and Virtue at the top of the curve. I, I'm going to speculate here, but I think these two cards are here to prevent your opponent from going bigger than you, which a lot of decks are trying to do. You know, if they do just Sunfall, you can you can come back from that. Um, and, you know, of course, Virtue of, of uh, the Virtue of Loyalty is also a way to go bigger as well. Uh, Goldhound and Big Score allow you to do some kind of some kind of rudimentary ramp so you can get to the top of that curve. And there's notably also a flesh three copies of Flesh Gorger there, which isn't bad as a seven drop either. 
Uh, honestly, Max, I really like the Gold Hounds in conjunction with Oni Colt Anvil because you're gonna go Gold Hound into Anvil, and then the next turn you can crack the Gold Ooh, Hound yeah. or that turn, and you're gonna get the one one back already, right? You're gonna get your value back, and you're gonna get to ramp. So that's pretty spicy, and it also works really nicely with Op Nixilis because it's got Menace. So you might get to just ping it, and your opponent loses exactly one life. So I, it's it's got some spice to it. There's a, there's some intricacies there that I really am a fan of. That said, we're gonna move it along. Let's talk about the next deck here, Rakdos Devils. So credit to X Buster of the MTG Rebellion Discord, and thank you for sending this list over. We had a ton of Rakdos list submissions. Yeah, we did. We did. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just a favorite in the Discord. Everybody loves playing with Rakdos, and I get it. It's fun. It's spicy. This one, to me, was the spiciest of the bunch because it's a combo deck with Devilish Valet. And what I love about Devilish Valet is that we're playing it with Gleeful Demolition the ability to just immediately trigger this three times and get it up to eight power that's fantastic you can get that on i mean you can get so many scenarios where you go like turn one dump an experimental synthesizer turn two anvil turn three maybe just chill don't even have to play anything out and then turn four devilish valet gleeful demolition four triggers on valet tech 16 let's go you know like it just explodes out of nowhere and that is so difficult to do in a standard meta these days but this one it's it's doing it so i'm i love it hats off to you x buster love it spicy list keep shooting them our way we love it oh yeah any, any deck that uses that devilish valet i'm i'm, I'm all for it if right? you can make that work that's awesome it's hard to hate on speaking it. of <laughs> oh yeah definitely speaking of if you can make it work let's talk about mono green stompy in standard credit to nerd time of the mtg rebellion discord so I just want to highlight a few cards. Mono Green is one of those archetypes that I try to make work every time a set comes out. I try to keep tinkering with it any chance I get. And unfortunately, it hasn't had a lot of success lately. We've gotten some more pieces, though. So is it Mono Green's time? Hard hitting question enables this deck to have a low cost interaction uh, that it really didn't have before. So you can interact with some of those low curve decks that are out there right now. Flourishing Bloomkin scales really well, enables late game antics, allows you to, you know, ramp into Invoke the Ancients, ramp into your, your big version of Nyssa. Uh, Pelucranos is also a card that seems well placed to tackle some of the low curve flyers that we're seeing in standard right now. And then I've always said, if green can draw cards, it'll do well. Sharp Eyed Rookie is the MVP here, I think, and it may be the key in the future for this archetype if it's going to have any kind of shot at becoming a top eight winner. Being able to draw and recover is is the point to being able to play a green deck well. Um, oh, notably, Pick Your Poison and Thrun, also really good mono green staples in the sideboard. And I mean, I'm just sitting here going, maybe we could get Nykthos in standard again and mono green could have a real run. I don't know. I don't know. A, a boy can dream, right? <laughs> so... These wizards. Yeah. <laughs> I know everybody will hate it within two weeks. I know that. I know that. Of course. <laughs> but like the first two weeks are going to be a lot of fun. Anyway, it's fine. It's not going to happen. Let's move on to our final segment, <laughs> predictions for the upcoming week. Now, Max, we've looked at 13 archetypes tonight. What are your predictions going into week eight of Karloff Manor Standard? So I'm calling next week to be more of the same, but I don't mean that in a bad way at all. I mean it in a good way. We're seeing new archetypes actually take top eights this late in the game of Karlov Manor. And with a new set, Thunder Junction just around the corner, uh, rotation even later than that this year, I can't wait to see how things shake up in Standard. This time though, I'm not saying that as a content creator who feels like Standard's gone stale, I feel like it's been invigorated uh, by these new archetypes. More archetypes, I suspect, will be introduced. Uh, even more staples are coming if Wizards follows the design strategy that they have for the last few sets. Creature-heavy decks being featured across many color sets. Uh, what will we see next? The reintroduction of Mono Green, maybe four or five more Rakdos archetypes. I know our Rebellion Discord will be happy with that. Uh, it's a great time to brew. Dig into that big card pool. See if you could be the next one that we talk about breaking the meta. Get after it, folks. But what about you, Darth Rictus? What can we expect to see happen next? I mean, Max, from where I'm standing, we saw three major developments manifest over this past weekend. First, we saw a newer, more resilient iteration of Temer Ramp running rampant. Pardon the pun, that's my dad joke for this one. <laughs> in standard right now, which in turn is leading to an emphasis on graveyard interaction, though Stone Brain has already been obsoleted by threat diversification from Temer, thanks to Doppelgang. Second, Croft's Eidetic Memory is officially the sleeper pick of the new set and is just starting to make its way into the highest levels of standard. Read this card, get to know these blue-based flyer lists that utilize it, they aren't going away anytime soon. Third, 
Convoke is pushing into Thalia post board now instead of Urbrask's Forge, adjusting for the hate that Control has prepared. And I'm saying all of this just to say that the format is still far more open than many believe. Gang, this is part of why we have Brewer's Corner. This is part of why we do these State of the Meta episodes. You never know when you're going to see a spicy list and find the missing pieces to turn it into a tier one contender. So get out there and just keep hunting. Oh yeah, thank you for your support by watching this video till the end. I want to give a special shout out to our members who have joined the Rebellion and support our content weekly. If you'd like to support what we do, be sure to turn on all notifications, join us for our premieres, like and subscribe. Those are the best ways to let us know that you want to see more of our competitive MTG content. Now, for those of you who can do a bit more, feel free to check out our merch below and join the Rebellion. Also be on the lookout for a new show coming out this week and the next Rebelcast episode later in the week from me and Athena. We thank you for contributing to the revolution in MTG content. Until next time, Rebels. Untap, upkeep, resist. Resist. <laughs>